Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to follow up on our discussion of polarization, which we kicked off in a previous video. In order to do that, we want to examine a paradox. The three polarizer paradox, to be specific. And so, the three polarizer paradox is as follows. You have two polarizers that are 90 degrees relative to one another, and they do not transmit any light. You then add a third polarizer in between them, and suddenly you are able to get light. What is happening? What is happening? And it turns out that despite the fact that there are plenty of weird, spooky quantum explanations for this, there is a... Translation mathematical explanations. There is actually a very clear and simple material explanation that depends on understanding at least two things, maybe three. One of which is the nature of light and what polarization actually is. The second of which is understanding what exactly is a polarizer and what is happening inside of the polarizer. And the third is how light moves and how these filamentary atomic connections that we talk about all the time are able to be broken and reformed. Yes, so let's start with what is light, just a quick recap. So essentially we have this model of the atom, we call it the radioelastic model of the atom, but essentially we're just interpreting quantum mechanics and saying, well, the atom appears to more or less exist within a certain radius, except there seems to be small influences of it at, at a distance. We interpret these as actual physical extensions of the shell of the atom, which we call filaments. And we're saying light is essentially a deformation of those filaments. Well, polarization tells us that light has an angular momentum, which is either right-handed or left-handed. Something is being twisted. In other words, the filaments, the extension struts from the surface of the atom, are being twisted one way or the other. Now, what a polarizer does is mysteriously decide which way right-handed or left-handed, a particular incident photon, a deformation event, is going to be relayed out of that polarizer. So we sat around a lot today investigating the molecular structure of polarizing filters, and we've come up with one particular solution which we think you're going to like. And maybe you guys have other ideas, but this is, what, this is where we're at for right now. So basically, if you, start to, if you start with thinking about the light that is being produced by an incandescent bulb, this is randomly polarized light. You have left-handed polarization, you have right-handed polarization, and the angle at which it impinges upon the plane of the polarizing filter is also random to some degree. And then after the polarizing filter, you have linearly polarized light. And linearly polarized light is not what you might think. It's not the fact that it's moving in one direction. Linearly polarized light is a what's called a superimposition of both left-handed and right-handed polarization. Now the quantum interpretation of that is going to be to tell you that that means that you have a, a you have both left-handed and right-handed light in a single in a single photon. And I don't we don't think that's true. If well, it's you, actually unimaginable. It's unimaginable, which is why we don't think that it's true. And so, if you have a two-atom universe, and there's light, there's a photon between those two atoms, you will always have circularly polarized light. It'll either be left-handed polarized, or it'll be right-handed polarized. But, if you were to have four atoms, two pairs of atoms, then you can have linearly polarized light, because one pair can rotate to the left, and one pair can rotate to the right, and now because you have an equal mixture, you have linearly polarized light rather than circularly polarized. Okay, so what does this have to do with the inner structure of a polarizer? The polarizer is in some ways similar to a diffraction grating in the sense that you have vertically aligned bars that are relaying light, but that's basically where it ends because the structure of the polarizer has to have an electrically conductive component. And for most polarizers, that component is iodine. So you have, what is it, polyvinyl acetate? You have some sort of plastic which is alternately insulating these long columns of atomic metal. You basically have these long strings of iodine atoms that are surrounded by an insulating material. Uh, and so if you look at this drawing, basically column one 
is a drawing of a single chain of these iodine atoms. And so the polarizing filter is basically like we're, we're in the plane of the polarizer looking down. So on the left is polarizer number one, on the right is polarizer number two that is separated at some distance. On the left side of this, there's an incandescent light source. On the right side of this is your eyeball. Okay, so all of the iodine atoms in this column have the same spin. They're all spinning in this right-handed direction. And they are traveling across the distance between the two polarizers. They are impinging on a different column of iodines and spinning those iodines in the same right-handed direction. Now, if you look at column two, these atoms are pink to represent that they are rotating in the left-handed direction. And the atoms all together rotate in the same direction, which means that the column of atoms has like a super rotation associated with it. And so the super rotation is transmitted across the gap between the two polarizers to rotate the second column of iodine atoms in the second polarizer, and you have linearly polarized light. Half of the columns are, spinning, are rotating in the left-handed direction, which are pink, Half of them are rotating in the right-handed direction, which are cyan. And you have full transmission on the other side of that polarizer. Just to be absolutely clear, the conductive columns are organizing the filaments that are stretched from one polarizer to the next. They're organizing those filaments such that all the filaments are twisting in the same way for a given column of atoms and their corresponding filaments. Mm -hmm. But, when you take that polarizer at a distance and you rotate it at 90 degrees, something really interesting happens geometrically. So, what happens is that instead of each column of left or right-handed atoms being correlated to a perfectly paired column of iodine atoms in the second polarizer, you have a situation where each resonant unit, which starts out as a column and then rotates to become a row, is now composed of a mixture of left-handed polarization and right-handed polarization. This means that the atoms are actually physically moving in opposite directions. Whereas before you had these insulated columns that were inside their PVA matrix and they were all spinning either in one direction completely or rotating either in one direction completely or in the other direction completely. Now you have a mixture of, of rotations inside of each, each unit that, if it cannot resonate, cannot transmit the light. This is four columns which are vertically aligned. This is the four columns across the way which are vertically aligned. There's a co cohesive ro surface rotation of all of these atoms in this column and in this column. These are the complete opposite, actually. And this is all well and good when they're parallel to each other. But when I turn this one sideways, all of these ones are now facing alternating opposite rotation atoms all the way down the line. And each one of these is again facing all opposite rotation, and there's no cohesion. That first polarizer is only able to resonate in a very specific direction which is dictated by the columnar organization of these PVA iodine tubes. And that means that it can either only rotate to the left or it can rotate to the right. When it's transmitting light, the column is rotating as a whole. If the column was not rotating as a whole, you wouldn't transmit light. The second polarizer is passive. It's only taking the angular momentum from the atoms of the first polarizer and mapping them onto its own columns. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, left-handed columns in polarizer one and left-handed columns in polarizer two when they're both aligned together. All of these filaments are impinging on this column. All of these filaments from this column are impinging on this column. Exactly. But when you turn it sideways, all of a sudden this columnar uh, filaments are all confused because they're hitting up opposite. They're not confused, they're just no longer hitting in the same column. Yeah. So like okay, you're perfect. looking at this That's column, the, the columns moving down still have the same rotation. No. 
but now the rows are the resonant unit, right? So whereas when it's like this, the, the column is the resonant unit, now when you rotate it, it's the row that is the resonant unit, and each row is made up of a mixture of rotations. It's made up of left rotation, right rotation, left rotation, right rotation, but each column is still, as is the first polarizer, all one rotation, but now they're not part of the input, same... The input, the, the filamentary input. input is all homogenous, but it's in the wrong direction. Basically. They're no longer part of the same resonant unit. Each resonant unit, instead of having one type of rotation in it, now has a mixture of rotations. And resonance cannot happen when you have a push and a pull at the same time. When you have a push and a pull, or you have a left rotation and a right rotation inside of the same unit at the same time, you have no light. And so you have the cohesive rotation of the first polarizer that is transmitting light impinging upon the second polarizer in a way that it dampens the rotation. It stops the rotation polarizer. And so what happens when you add the third polarizer? Well, the third polarizer is simply allowing you access to part of the column. You're getting slight columnar excitation because it is oriented with respect to the first, uh, the first polarizer in such a way that it's actually letting a little bit of that light come through. And so you've restored the light to your darkened situation. And to tie it back to the question of angular momentum, we were thinking about this at first, where if you had the two polarizers that were parallel with one another and you rotated one, that you would maintain the filamentary connections as they were in this conformation. But we realized that that can't be possible because as you move your, as you move your body, as you move an object or a body through this filamentary network, it axiomatically must be the case that you're breaking filaments as you move. Because yeah, so this is like a bigger nested question about the entire model, which is like, hey, do, does a filament stay connected when a body moves? Or are the filaments just being spallated out from a central point? Are they radial in all directions? And therefore, when an atom moves around, it's making new connections constantly. And honestly, if you just follow through with the logic of the inverse square law, which we deduced in this video, you end up with an understanding that the radial filaments are radial no matter what. They point outward from their center. And so you're constantly getting new filamentary connections. And that's kind of critical to what's happening here. Because if the filamentary connections were maintained, then you would never get the cancellation at 90 degrees because your original conformation of resonant transmission, like with parallel columns, would be maintained. But because it's not maintained at 90 degrees, it must mean that the filaments remain and the atoms move from filament to filament, which is wild because we have not yet figured out a mechanism that allows you to maintain tension and allows you to move. Yeah. But it has to be. Yeah, this is huge. So I think we should put a pen in it and get everybody's questions. I really hope that this cleared things up a little bit, but I think we're going to probably have to keep going through it over and over again. And um, if, if you don't get it, uh, tell us where you get lost, and we will try to have better pictures and go through it again and make sure that there's a version of this explanation that everybody understands and that everyone thinks is plausible. Because we need you, we need our audience to be able to come through and be like, hey, I think that this part makes sense, but I don't follow here, so that we know how to tune these explanations to actually make sense. And hopefully, once we get a little bit of time or cash, we'll be able to animate these in the spirit of how we've done some of the other animations. They're just extremely time consuming, like, like four days to render 70 frames kind of time consuming. And so, you know, we'll, we'll work towards a really nice, beautiful animation of this eventually. Otherwise, thank you guys for tuning in and tell us what you think. We'll see you guys next time.